Teaching Awards Assessor for both CELTA and DELTA schemes. And Craig has, an, has extensive experience developing and teaching English language courses to adult learners, including ESP and EAP courses. And Craig is co-author of Real Listening and Speaking, Level 2, as well as being author of Teacher Training Essentials and Cambridge Academic English Intermediate. And his publications include Real Listening and Speaking 2, uh, Teacher Training Essentials and Cambridge Academic English, as well as, uh, I've mentioned there, Cambridge English in Power. So, uh, very warm welcome to you, Craig, right at the other side of the world to me in, in New Zealand today. So, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. And... Um... Good morning, everyone. Uh, but from me, it's good evening because it's um, nine o'clock at night here. So um, thank you very much for joining the seminar. And um, uh, from wherever you are, whether it's good morning, good afternoon or good evening, um, it's, it's great to have you with us. So we're going to be looking at uh, better reading for learning. So we're going to be focusing on learning skills. And what I'd like to do in this webinar, first of all, I'd like to start by looking at some beliefs, um, some beliefs that I have had over the years about reading. Um, I'd like to look at texts and tasks. I'd also like to look at skills and strategies. And finally, I'd like to touch on um, extensive reading and, and have a very, very quick look at that. But let's um, get underway. So let's start by looking at some um, beliefs, some opinions and statements about re reading. So I would like you to react to these three statements um, by typing the number. And then if you, you can just write A if you agree, PA if you partially agree, and then just D if you disagree to these three statements about reading. So the first one is if readers can read in their L1, in their first language, then they can learn to read in English. The second one is spend plenty of time accessing and developing learners' background knowledge on the topic of the text before they read. And the third one is grade the task and not the text. So what I mean by grade is, is simplify. So make the task easy, simplify the task and make that easy. But don't uh, simplify the text in any way, don't grade it. So we'll just wait a moment to see um, what your opinions are. Okay, so we're getting, already we've got people with um, very different opinions, um, with these people agreeing, disagreeing, partially agreeing. I'll just wait a minute. Everyone's typing at once, so it's taking a while for the all the answers to come up. Okay. Okay, so there is quite a range of um, of opinions um, in terms of what what you believe and what you think. Um, these three statements are things that I have believed in the past. Um, I partially agree, but I think um, there are some points to consider with with um, with all three statements. So often, yes, learners are able to transfer their um, first language reading skills um, to, to, to learning English. That is the case for some learners. But over the years, what I've found out is that um, it, not all learners do actually read in their first language. So I've often been speaking to learners, uh, my own learners, and sort of saying, do this, do this, do that, when they're <clears throat> reading English and reading in English. But then they will often say to me, but actually, I don't do any of this when I um, read in my first language. Also, by talking to students, I found that different languages have a different culture, a different attitude towards reading. So students will often have a different attitude towards reading because of their culture. So, for example, speaking may be more, more important in their culture. The other thing is I wonder whether reading skills and strategies do automatically transfer from one language to another. So, for example, the kind of skills and strategies that you might need to be able to read characters in Mandarin, are those same skills and strategies going to be useful when you are reading in English? So those are some kind of points to consider, I think, in terms of, of this transfer from first, to se first language to English. 
the second point, um, spend plenty of time accessing and developing learners' background knowledge. So yes, I certainly have done this. This is often what um, is called activating schemata, so getting students to think about the topic of a text. But what do we mean here? Do we mean just general knowledge or cultural knowledge or, or knowledge associated with that particular topic? And then what if the topic is not interesting? So if you're trying to get students to kind of um, activate knowledge and they're not motivated, they're not interested, that maybe is not going to help them with the reading. But most importantly, I think, does this background knowledge, does will that help them with what I would call bottom-up reading skills or strategy? So for example, if it's um, academic English and they're having to unpack a complex noun phrase in some way, background knowledge may not be a lot of use there. The final point, um, grade the task and not the text. So if 30% of a text is not easy to understand, that could be a little bit frustrating for learners and it may not result in a very kind of beneficial or, or, or positive reading experience. And you know, obviously we want our learners to be reading. The other issue is obviously we want them to be fluent readers so that they can actually read quickly and they can they can read a lot of text. And if they're having to rely on dictionaries a lot when they read, um, that's not going to help their fluency. So William Grade in Grave in his book Reading in a Second Language, he estimates that it takes about 10,000 words to have a good chance of being able to understand an academic text. So that's quite a lot of vocabulary that learners need to read. So, I mean, if you have a, an academic text, that's very, very challenging if you give that to, say, um, a pre-intermediate, a B1 level learner. So although I have believed all of these things in the past, I I'm not, it's not that I don't believe them necessarily, but I do think that these beliefs, these thoughts do need to be considered. Um, and I want to explore some of these issues in the session tonight. Sorry, this morning, tonight for me. Um, so here's another interesting, just a very easy task about text grading, simplifying the text. So Grabe, William Grabe, did some research on this and he actually arrived at a percentage um, in which he felt it was necessary for a learner to be able to understand in order to read successfully. So what I'd like you to do is try and guess what percentage he arrived at. Is it 90%, 95% or 98%? So just type into the chat which one you think it is. Okay, so there's a lot of people choosing A, 90%. A and B. So hardly anyone's choosing C. So it's between A and B in effect. So what Grabe's research showed is in fact, he, he, he arrived at the conclusion that in order for learners to be able to understand a text successfully, they need to be able to understand 95% and they'll still need some kind of instructional support. So instructional support might be something along the lines of uh, maybe pre-teaching some key words in the text, some, some of the vocabulary. He makes the point, and it's actually quite a good one, that if you have a 500 word text, and often like at upper intermediate level, B2 level, reading texts and course books can be at about 500 words. If students have 90% understanding, that means there will be 50 unknown words. And, and that does potentially lead to a degree of um, reader frustration. So that's worth bearing in mind, I think, um, this 95% figure and, and the degree to which learners need to understand what they're reading so they don't get frustrated. In order to help us with that, um, there is this resource available, English Profile. So English Profile basically is a, is a corpus of learner language and it's lists of vocabulary and they have been tagged with a CEFR level. So, for example, if you choose a word, you're, you're looking at a text, you might um, see a word, you think, oh, is this going to be a little bit difficult? You want to find out. You can type it into English Profile 
and that will give you um, a CFR level for that particular word and associated with a particular meaning. So this is something that we can do when we are preparing text for learners. We can look at English Profile. It's freely available. You just log in and, and you register a first time, then you can use it as a resource. So this can actually help us determine whether a text is going to be too difficult in terms of the, the, the vocabulary. So there is a tool there available to help us with that um, when you're preparing texts. So what I'd like to look at in the session, for the rest of the session, is I'd like to look at some example texts and whether they're suitable or not. I'd like to look at some an example of a task and, and what's suitable, and I've got some good ideas for some, some tasks. I'd like to look at the issue of skills versus strategies. And then, as I mentioned before, I'd like to have a look at extensive reading. Um, just touch on that briefly at the end of the session. So <clears throat> are, your in, are your learners interested in social media? Um, mine are. They're permanently glued to their mobile to their um, mobile phones when in, in breaks because they're constantly checking um, Facebook or uh, Weibo or, or some kind of social media. So if so, I'd like you to look at this article from by John Lanchester, who is a, a writer. It's from the London Review of Books. Would you? Th this article is talking about the way in which Facebook puts people in like-minded groups. So I'd like you to look at this excerpt from the article and decide whether you would use this with upper intermediate level learners, B2 level students. So just quickly skim read it, um, don't go into too much detail, and decide whether you would use this with upper intermediate level students. So we're getting quite a few no's, OK? Yeah, no to academic. Good. So if this were a general English class, I, I probably wouldn't use this um, with them uh, for, the, for the following reasons. Um, so if I think of a typical upper intermediate group that I get here in New Zealand, um, if they weren't studying for EAP, but even then I would maybe think twice about it, um, I think there's quite a lot of challenging academic lexis in it, um, which I think would make it quite hard. Um, I also think that there's quite a bit of complex grammar in it, sort of some densely packed noun phrases. Um, subordination, very complex syntax, which I've highlighted here in, in, in red. Um, and the other thing about this particular text, I mean, John, I, I personally find this text very interesting myself, um, but one of the main points he's making about it is he's saying that, in effect, that if you are a Facebook user, um, you are the product. So it's it, he's sort of saying, you know, um, you are the product. So I can imagine some of the learners that I've taught may not be particularly receptive to, the, to, to this message. So there are certain learner groups where I would be sort of cautious with this in terms of their interest because you know they are they're on Facebook all day and every day when they're when they're not in the classroom. So to actually turn around and say to them, well, you know, actually you're just a product, um, may not be um, what they want to hear. So um, I went onto the BBC website and I found this text, which I think with a general English upper intermediate um, group of learners, I think might be more suitable. So it's still looking at this issue of whether, you know, of, of problems associated with social media, um, issues that have arisen in the last year or so. Um, and it's also looking at kind of some of the dangers, some of the pitfalls of using social media too much. But of course, the language, I think, is more manageable in this particular um, example. And at the same time, I think it doesn't have this you know, potentially quite negative message for some students where it's saying, well, you're just a product. This is actually just, it is alerting them to some of the dangers without actually telling them that they're just a product. So this, in effect, what I'm saying is that to, to kind of generalize the point I'm making here, 
is that when you're looking at text, I think that you do need to look at an appropriate level of challenge. Um, I think that you need to choose texts that do reflect learners' interests, so you need to be aware of that. It's nice if you can get something that's going to engage learners, something, some kind of hook, um, an interesting bit of information. It could be some research that's been done, some interesting facts and figures, um, something that's really going to sort of pull them in. It could be a, you know, a, a curious little story, a sort of a quirky, interesting story. I also think that it's, it's useful if you can provide some kind of visual support. I mean, I think that learners these days um, are very visually literate. So if you can actually provide some kind of visual support. And then it's also interesting to think about learners present, but also their future needs. So if you think that, you know, they are probably going to go on and do some kind of exam class like IELTS or, or maybe Cambridge first, or maybe they're going to study, go on and study EAP. It's worth bearing that in mind in terms of the kind of um, the text that you um, that, that you select. So Peter Watkins, who I think is um, in this webinar tonight, um, he um, in his book um, Develop Teaching and Developing Reading Skills, he talks about um, low level learners probably are going to be exposed to um, especially written material or adapted material um, because of, it, it is very, as he says, it's very, very hard to find authentic material that's going to be manageable for them. And as they become more proficient, as their language competence develops, then teachers are more likely to be able to use more authentic text with, with learners. Um, so I think that this is, um, this sort of goes to that um, belief in terms of grading the grading the task and not the text. I think, you know, particularly at lower levels, it is important to grade the text and simplify things a little. Okay, so I'd like to look at an excerpt from um, a, a piece of reading material. Now, I've taken this from the Empower Reading Plus worksheets, which are freely available online on the um, Cambridge English Empower homepage. There's a resources tab where there are free worksheets with teacher's notes, um, Reading Plus worksheets that, that you can get. And this is um, one from B2 level. So um, I think Simon has is, um, is posted a link to, the, to these worksheets in the chat. So could you just quickly have a look at this text? Again, skim read it. Um, and your task is, is this something that you would like to do? What Tom, this guy Tom has done, having a food adventure in Rome. So I'll just give you a minute to read the text. Okay, so I'm assuming that, um, yeah, so it's whether you'd use it or not, I'm not sure. It's just whether you'd like to go to Rome and um, learn how to cook, it really, is, 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 um, is maybe my quest, my task wasn't very good. Um, so anyway, this is just an excerpt. The, the blog goes on for, 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 for a little bit longer, so I've just taken a little bit. Um, so what I'd like you to do now is look at the, the six comprehension questions at the bottom of the page. And I'd like you to read these and decide how effective you think these would be as reading comprehension questions as a detailed reading task. So I'll just give you a moment to read those questions. And um, yeah, some people are saying, no, they're too simple. OK, yeah. Good. 
Okay, so at B2 level, I think most of the people who have answered so far have indicated that these questions are too simple. And yes, I agree with that. Um, the questions are not only simple, but they're also what I would call liftable. So this means that the wording of the question is more or less the same as the wording um, of the language in the text. And this means that students can actually just lift the answer from the text um, without actually necessarily understanding the, the information. So um, these are not, I would say, very successful as, as um, comprehension questions for that particular excerpt from the text for that very reason. They're too simple and the answers are liftable from the text without actually having checked comprehension. <clears throat> It's a little bit unclear, but um, the, uh, yeah, sorry, it's, it, it hasn't come out, out so clearly here on the slide. But what the readers, what the learners need to do, um, the, the actual text and the, the, sorry, the actual task on the worksheet is that they need to understand what different characters in the blog are thinking. So they have to, that means that they actually have to infer information um, and that does require to, them to read in far more depth and detail. So that's just to, to, to make a point and um, wait one point, but in terms of looking at reading tasks, I think of it in a more general sense, um, I think these are some good pointers, some useful pointers. So they need to provide a good level of challenge so they're not too easy or too difficult and certainly that the information is not liftable in that way. It's a good idea if you can make the task relevant to the, the text type that, that you've got. Um, so in this previous example, there are it, it talks about a lot of people and what they may be thinking. So this idea of inferring people's thoughts um, does in fact relate to the, the nature of the, the blog as a whole, if you, if you see the full version. You can aim to make the questions relevant and personalized. And um, we're going to look at a specific example of this. We also need to be aware, you need to think quite carefully about the depth of comprehension required. So you don't want students initially to have to read very, very deeply if it's the first time they encounter a text. So you might give a more manageable just reading task and then in a second reading task, get them to, um, to maybe understand in a little bit more detail. I also think it's good to um, think about learners' awareness of the function of different text types and genre. Now let's have a look at what I mean by that. So again, this is um, <clears throat> an example from the um, Empower Reading Plus worksheets. So this is a, a, a reading task where students have to look for adjectives and they have to um, then decide what kind of text this is. And the correct answer is that it gives a clear description. So this aims to get learners focused on the idea that this is um, a descriptive text in effect. So that d developing that kind of awareness and um, an understanding of what the function of a text is. But again, um, Peter Watkins talks about um, activities that engage learners on an effective level and they promote descriptions of emotions and feelings that the text evokes. Now, I've got an example of that from Peter's book um, that I've mentioned already. So this, this is Peter's book, Teaching and Developing Reading Skills. And he's got this lovely task, which I'm going to show you now, which is one of the many ideas that is in his book, but he's got a lot of practical ideas there, which um, I strongly recommend if you're looking for ideas for tasks. But this is a very, very simple idea, and I think it's fantastic because you can use it with quite a range of different texts. Learners read the text and they go through and um, note it, make, make notes against um, information in the text, and they tick the information if they agree with it, they put a cross if they disagree with it, they put a question mark if they don't fully understand what, what the writer is trying to say, they can put an ellipsis if they want more information or explanation, they can put arrows if they can compare this information to something else that they know, they can put a, an exclamation mark for something that's surprising and shocking, and they can put a um, lol if they find something in the text amusing. This is a very, very simple idea, um, it, it, but it works really, really well. I've tried it. Um, I've tried it with different levels um, 
and with different kinds of, of text and it, and it works very well it's very effective so I mean the great thing about this is it also requires very little preparation but if you have a look at Peter's book he's got ideas for tasks like that and lots of other ideas so it's a, a really useful resource in that way <clears throat> I'd now like to move on and looking at the idea of skills and strategies and I'd like you to look at these six reading activities and I'd like you to decide whether you think they are a skill or a strategy. So you can just type the number into the chat, one, two, three, four, five, six, and write SK for skill and ST for strategy. So I'll just pause for a moment and give you a little bit of time to do that. Also, Simon in the chat has posted um, a link um, about Peter's book. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend it. Okay, so everyone is typing. So just wait a minute at a time so people have got time to read and comment. Okay, so there is a little bit of um, a range of opinions um, and that is exactly what I anticipated, um, that people have different ideas in terms of um, whether these are skills or strategies and I will confess that this is slightly a trick question. Um, it isn't easy to answer. So I'm going to go to the go to the answer now um, um, because it is it is quite tricky. It is I, I believe it's actually quite difficult to separate these out into skills and strategies because in effect they can be perceived as both. Um, sometimes they might be skills for certain readers. Sometimes they might be strategies for other readers. And what it largely depends on is the ability the reading ability of the learner or of, of the reader. So I'd like to explain um, what I mean by that. So William Grabe in his um, in the other book that I've mentioned, Reading in a Second Language, he talks about this distinction between skill and strategy. So he says that a strategy is something that involves conscious effort, that we are kind of we're aware that we are doing it. Whereas a skill tends to happen subconsciously, so it, it happens actually automatically. And then he goes on to cite Anderson saying that a skill is a strategy that has become automatic. So the goal of strategy instruction is to move readers from conscious control of reading strategies to unconscious use of reading skills. So this is in effect what we as teachers are trying to do when we highlight strategies and give students practice in reading strategies in a classroom situation is what we're trying to do is is develop these in such a way that they do become automatic so that the the learners will kind of automatically just sort of think well there's a word i don't know I'll try and work out what it means i.e the strategy of, of um, guessing meaning in context rather than doing it in a very sort of self-conscious way. It's because this because the strategy has become automatic and it, and it happens quite naturally. So thinking about strategies, and I promise you this one isn't a trick um, task, um, there is an answer. Um, what I'd like you to do is look at these six um, strategies and sort them into two groups. Which ones would you associate with understanding information and which would you associate with understanding language? So again, I'll just give you a moment to type that into the chat. And as I said, I promise you this is not a, a trick question. There isn't 
an answer that we can look at. Okay, so some answers beginning to come through now. Yeah, so the, uh, I think the answers here are a little bit more consistent um, than they were for the previous task, understandably so. So thank you for your contributions. Okay, so I think most would um, probably agree with this. Um, just it's very difficult. There's a lot of there are a lot of answers to kind of scan read, but I think um, most people seem to be along these lines that one, three, and four to do with content, the main idea, and inferring writer's point of view are more associated with information. Whereas two, five, and six are more associated with strategies for um, looking at language. So um, what I've also done for each one is I've put the language system that I think that it focuses on. So number two is, is focused on vocabulary. Number five is focused on grammar. And number six is focused on, on discourse. So um, this, I think, is interesting to consider um, whether we are look at with training learners or giving learners help and support in developing strategies um, that focus on information or language. So obviously, it's important to do both. I mean, learners need practice in, in both. And I think that in many reading lessons and a lot of uh, reading materials, there's perhaps a little bit more emphasis on developing strategies to understand information. I mean, you know, a lot of course books these days are very, very good at, at kind of um, lead in activities um, to activate schemata, um, to providing pictures for, for learners to look at, to kind of familiarize themselves with a particular context, which is going to help them understand the information on the text. What I wonder, though, is whether it's worth thinking about focusing a little bit more on developing bottom-up reading strategies that get students to understand language. So there could be a section of a text that learners find difficult to understand. And one of the ways, perhaps, of, of allowing them to deal with this is by actually getting them to focus on the language. Now, I'm going to show you an example of what I mean as a um, language-focused reading strategy. So what I've done is I've taken a sentence from the article by John Lanchester in the London Review of Books. And um, I, as I said, there are a few classes that I might use this with, but um, they would be higher level classes, maybe C1, C2 level classes. Um, but I wouldn't certainly be using, doing this kind of activity with B2 level learners. So I'd like you to what I'd like to do is just kind of talk you through the way that um, this one example sentence from that text is, um, is structured, because I think that this sentence is quite tricky because it's, it's quite dense with information and it's not easy to, to understand. So let's look at what's going on here. So <clears throat> first of all, we can note that it is a, a compound sentence and you've got two clauses which are joined by, by and. If we look at the first clause, um, we can find the verb are. So we've got both a subject, um, which is a noun phrase, and a complement, which is um, a noun phrase. So there we go, two noun phrases just with one verb. And these noun phrases are quite densely packed. But also, we've got something quite tricky in the first noun um, phrase. We've got these developments. And obviously, the these is referring back to something that's been previously mentioned in the text. So you've got um, this idea of what we'd call anaphoric reference. So reference back to something that is previously mentioned. So that needs to be highlighted. Um, 
it might be useful to um, with the um, the first noun phrase to actually highlight what the head noun is and in this case it's terms so the portmanteau terms for these developments um, so that we might need to focus on that then moving on to the second clause um, in the sentence we've got they the, pr the pronoun which is referring back to terms then we've got the verb um, but in this case it is a passive verb and it ends with the preposition by so that means by something so in effect this very last part of the sentence is another very densely packed noun phrase <clears throat> and within that noun phrase you've got a lot of um, post modification with prepositions going on um, in order to um, yeah create this very long and very dense noun phrase so when you kind of look at that particular sentence um, it sort of grammatically speaking it's very very um, it's very difficult it's got quite a complex construction it's also full of nouns um, and you know each noun has um, is related to a particular sort of meaning so there's kind of a lot of ideas um, buzzing around so that it could be quite difficult to understand so that's the kind of analysis that you can do and you could do a um, you know a sort of a simple task like that so first of all um, give students a kind of a, an empty grid of this nature in which they actually have to isolate the component bits the different um, complex noun phrases so that just helps break it up a little bit um, we've got the, um, the verb and um, a preposition and the, the linking word and then you might have some questions so what are the first two noun phrases in the sentence what is the final noun phrase in the sentence how many prepositions does it contain do we know who made the new terms possible so that's focusing on the passive and then the final two questions are focusing on the the reference items so there's a I mean this is um, just a this is one task that focuses on one sentence and in doing this and actually doing this kind of analysis it's trying to point out the way that maybe complex language is operating and hopefully that will give students some strategies because what probably is going to happen as students are reading and there could be a little chunk of text that they're finding difficult to understand and make sense of and if you've shown them how you can actually break it down um, using grammar um, and I think that noun phrases are often quite important particularly when students are reading um, academic language um, which is why I've sort of emphasized it a little bit because it's often with EAP and reading an EAP um, that you that syntax and grammar is tricky and students need some kind of bottom-up support so this is what I mean by um, by bottom-up reading skills and those that are, are focusing on language taking an example sentence like that doing some kind of analysis to actually guide them as to how they could um, approach a difficult sentence when they're reading by themselves <clears throat> okay finally extensive reading so William Grave has said that you know to, to be a really really good reader um, a very fluent reader you probably need a vocabulary of about 40,000 words so he also says that if students understand about 10,000 words and this he's not including inflections um, suffixes um, those kinds of distinctions um, like adding plurals etc um, if they understand that much then uh, a second language learner has got a reasonable chance at understanding an academic text but they still may not be able to read fluently so this is um, this is very interesting um, and what it clearly says is that in order for learners to um, read fluently they actually need to be able to um, develop their vocabulary how are they going to develop their vocabulary they're going to have to read I think so no other set of reading activities or reading practice can substitute for reading a longer text with reasonable comfort and without needing to stop constantly so in effect learners will learn to read um, fluently and well and develop vocabulary if 
they actually get plenty of reading practice. Um, so there's only so much I think that we can do inside the classroom. We can provide students with strategies um, that will that will help them when they encounter difficulty. But a lot of reading actually needs to be done outside the classroom. But again, this is something that I think that probably we need to set up. So one idea that I've used with students in the past is um, by getting students to focus on a, a graded reader. So for example, um, they, they, um, you, you could get the whole class with the same reader, or you could, um, if, the, if you've got a library in your school and students have got access to a range of different readers, they could be um, using different readers. So it's, it's sometimes not enough just to say, you know, could get a reader and read it. I think that as teachers, we, if we kind of manage the process a little bit, encourage students a little bit more, um, then that will help. So um, one ways of doing this is with this reader, if students are all reading a reader of some kind, that we set homework regularly, um, which is reading. So, you know, tonight I want you to read another chapter of, um, of the reader that you've got. You can then follow this up with in-class activities. So speaking activities where, I mean, if the two students are, um, are reading a different reader, they can tell each other about what they read. Um, if they're reading the same reader, you could maybe set up role play activities where they actually act out a, a scene or a situation from the chapter that they all read the previous, um, the previous evening. You could do vocabulary activities um, and then you could do writing activities, which could be summaries or reviews or, or things of that nature. Sometimes if, every, if all students have got a reader, um, why not spend just a little bit of time in class doing silent reading. Um, so just to, to keep them focused on that reader. You can set up races, reading races, where students have to read and it's the, you know, the first student or the first group to actually read um, a bit of text and answer a question correctly. So you turn it into a kind of a competition to, to make it fun. You can read aloud and um, the students can either follow you as you read aloud. This will also help a little bit with reading comprehension. Or maybe you can just read aloud um, and um, list the students listen and they go home and, and reread what you've read out aloud in class. Um, I used to, this used to happen to me when I was at primary school, I loved being read to. Um, and that actually um, motivated me to, to, to read books when I was kind of about seven or eight years old. Um, so these are some kind of things that maybe we forget to do. But the aim here ultimately is to, is to do a few things in class with the ultimate aim that students will be reading. Um, they will be reading in order, in order to read more outside of class. I've just seen that someone has asked, what is a reading race? It's basically what happens is you, um, it's a timed reading. Well, you, um, you set, you give students a text, they turn it over, um, there maybe is a question that they have to answer at the end. So it's the first question, sorry, it's the first student who can read that bit of text and answer the question correctly, who wins the race um, in effect. So it's just adding that um, slightly competitive element for it. But it becomes like a game and that, that often is motivating for students. So to sum up, <clears throat> texts, we want them to be interesting, um, but they do need to be manageable and appropriate for different levels. Tasks need to be achievable, but certainly not liftable and too easy. And ideally, they should be relevant to the kind of text type that you're getting students to read. With skills and strategies, we made the point that we you know, focus on strategies so that they become skills. But one of the points um, I, I, I wonder is whether we do need to rethink bottom, what I would call bottom up or detailed reading strategies, focusing on language a little bit more than perhaps we do at the moment. And then extensive reading, obviously we want to integrate reading into your teaching program as much as possible to ensure that learners are reading outside the classroom. Okay, so these are the references um, that I um, have used in preparation for this seminar. And I think, yes, we've got some time left for questions.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Craig. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we do have time for questions. Um, please use the chat box to type those in. Um, I mean, we can kick off with one right now from um, Viviana, I think, we, who, who asks, how about uh, motivating learners to get into reading? What sort of things can be done there to, to get um, your students into, into reading? Um, <clears throat> that, I mean, that obviously, that's a very good point. So, the, I mean, the, the obvious answer is find out what they are interested in reading, um, what, what kind of topics that they're, they're interested in reading, and try to find something that is going to be manageable for them associated with, with that topic. So I think that topic is, is, is critical, particularly if you've got learners who are not motivated to read and maybe don't read a lot in their first language. So if they're interested in football, try to find something associated with the football in English. If they're interested in cooking, likewise, something to do with that. If they're interested in politics, something that is going to be manageable. But by the same token, um, think very carefully about their level and make sure that whatever text that you're suggesting that they um, read is going to be manageable for them. because. Even if they love football and you find a text um, from an English newspaper about football, but they are B1 level and, you know, often, you know, sports, sports journalism has a lot of kind of jargon in it, that could be um, off, off putting for them and, and, and that won't motivate, motivate them. So to my mind, in terms of motivations, though, those are the two key things, topic and um, manageability so that learners you know, they approach reading and they feel as though they're being successful um, when they read for the first time. And that's, I think, critical at, at lower levels. Um, and that's, you know. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I remember buying a reader for wanting to learn Spanish and it was just too, uh, too high a level for me. It's collecting dust on the shelf now. I just, you know, it's all about pitching the right level I think because it would just turn <laughs> turn me off reading that I couldn't exactly. I couldn't do it very demotivating uh, Peter just made a very good point yeah. in response to Viviana's question yeah perhaps he yeah. says perhaps also uh, make learners aware of the benefits of extensive reading such as um, you know research suggests vocabulary growth a very important one I know how important vocabulary is in learning uh, yeah. all new words associated with uh, perhaps any topic or or some such thing, uh, and grammar development as well. It's not only uh, you know the, the vocabulary; it's learning structures and uh, grammar as well. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. That's a very good point, and I would yeah I fully agree with that. Um, um, you know, pointing out this kind of relevance and the way that it can really help learners' um, languages. Um, is, is also another question from An Anderson who asks, uh, so could you I'm provide some examples of vocabulary exercises? So, um, well, vocabulary exercises, so the obvious one is, um, you know, vocabulary in context. Vocabulary, I mean, vocabulary exercises, that, I mean, it, it kind of depends on the text. So sometimes I will have a vocabulary exercise where I focus on vocabulary that I think that learners are going to need before they read the text. Um, and that might involve visuals, it might involve um, matching, I might put those, you know, those words in a sentence and then from the context that the sentence provides, they then match it to a definition and then I'd back that up with kind of sort of oral concept questions of, of some kind. But then sometimes um, I look at the vocabulary and think, okay, that word may be difficult, but I think that they can probably guess the meaning of that uh, particular word from the context. Um, but sometimes the kind of um, activity that you do there, you, they, learners may need a little bit of guidance because often I see teachers just say, okay, look at those words, guess what they mean. And learners often find that a little bit challenging and you might need to sort of stage that a little bit more carefully and say, okay, look at the words around it. Okay, what part of speech do you think that word is? Um, okay, it seems to be associated with these other words you know the meaning of. What does it seem to suggest? Um, and then you might offer, you know, maybe some ideas and definitions 
and, and get them to decide which one is correct. If you have a text which is on a particular topic and actually has a, um, a lot of vocabulary associated with that topic, you can do um, more sort of systematic vocabulary exercises where you get students to organize you know, different words associated with that topic into parts of speech. And that might then lead on to looking at um, you know, different suffixes that are used in terms of parts of speech. Um, you know, if it, if it ends of ION, it's going to be a noun, that kind of thing. And they could, you know, complete a whole grid, which, which gives them an, an overview. So, I mean, I think there's quite a range of, of vocabulary exercises that you can do both before the, reading the text and after reading the text. Um, and, and those, you know, off the top of my head are some ideas. But, I mean, arguably, the, you know, this could be the topic of a whole other webinar, um, looking at... Um, how vocabulary is dealt with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Just looking at Francesca, she says uh, we have set up a book club um, that they have in their school, uh, which is a very good idea, actually, a, a book club. And um, looking further down the list, so is Leone. I think she said um, they had uh, the luxury of having bean bags in their school. So changing the setting, making it a bit more relaxing, I think, is a great idea. Actually, it, it doesn't always have to. Be be at the desk, does it? It could be in a different setting just to uh, have a quiet space. I think that's also uh, quite important. Mm -hmm. mm. um, Leone has also made a, uh, has also um, put a nice idea of um, sometimes giving a dictation mm. from a book to whet students' appetite. So, um, you know, particularly with things like, I don't know, crime stories and thrillers. Um, exactly. You can, dictate the cliffhanging paragraph which is going to um, you know, get students racing home to read what happens next. Um, so you know books are you know a lot of books are stories and stories have narrative and narrative will often pull students in um, but obviously it's got to be a story that they can relate to with characters. Sure, fantastic. Any, any last few questions? We've got a couple more minutes uh, still to go so any anything else anyone wants to type in? Um, please do keep them coming. Craig is here and, and willing to answer questions, so do use him. Just looking down the list, don't even see any, any further questions there, Craig. Any points? Do teachers read? Somebody's just said. <laughs> I suppose that could be a point if you're a, if you're an avid reader and you've got a passion for it. It could rub off on your on your students. Um, yeah. Well. Well, that that actually is um, the research does show that that is important. Um, so that's um, that that actually does have a role also in coming back to the motivation question. Is this idea of actually setting up a, a culture in the classroom where you kind of promote reading as something interesting to do? So one of the things that um, a teacher can do is actually share um, your experience. Um, and you know, once, twice a week, sort of say, I'm reading this really interesting book at the moment. So you know, demonstrating that reading is part of your life and it's something that you do on a daily basis, and it's interesting that's something that you get pleasure from. Um, not an you know, not in an obvious way, but just it, it's part of your kind of classroom discourse, and so it means that you set up this sort of this environment where reading is something interesting and useful to do. Um, so that that. Okay, excellent. I, I think um, yeah, just a few more points coming through there. I think that's we're nearly out of out of time there. Um, thanks again, Craig, for this. I think um, we've all learned something here. An obvious one for me was a reading race. Actually, I never thought of that. That's a, that's a really good idea. Um, okay, right. Yeah, and the other thing is <clears throat> the other thing I just reiterate the. Um, so, if you're looking for extra reading material, the um, the Empower Reading Plus worksheets, they're free, they don't cost anything, um, and they have been sort of designed up to look like course yep. material, and they have teaching notes, so they are available at all levels. Um, I think we're putting and, up a link. Um, yeah, to to Lawrence, uh, just putting up a link right, right now. And you can put up a link again. So, um, so there's, you know, there's um, about 12 yeah, lessons per yeah, level yeah. there. Um, and that's free. <laughs> so, um, so go for it. <laughs>
Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for, for participating. I've really enjoyed speaking to you all. And um, yeah, great. Luck. Thank, thanks thank a lot, then, Craig. We'll, we'll let you get off to bed. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just put up the, the link again for the certificate so that. Um, Okay. So that we, I think it's already there. So yes, it's been po it's been pointed out to me. It's in the middle of the screen. <laughs> the thing I didn't see. So yeah, there's a certificate link up there. So um, thank you everybody as well for attending. I know it's uh, it's an hour out of your day, and uh, we really do like people coming to these things. Um, and I yeah hope you've learned something new. And that's all for for this time. So thanks again, Craig, and goodbye everybody.